Hello and welcome to the Behind Closed Doors podcast. My name is Alicia Abberley and I'm so grateful that you've joined us in this space. Behind Closed Doors is all about the types of conversations that we only usually have with our best friend, our partner, our counsellor, our coach. And sometimes it's the conversations that we don't actually have with anybody else at all. The women that are interviewed in this space are all women that are making a difference to the planet. They're women that are inspiring and empowering. The intention is that you too will feel inspired and empowered by these conversations. So grab a cup of your favorite drink, pop your feet up and enjoy this episode of Behind Closed Doors. Today's guest shares her access to multidimensional awareness through ceremonial experiences, deep healing, potent frequency upgrades and intentional integration, which allows for the true soul signature to activate and allows manifestation to accelerate with focused ease. Our guest began her journey in the entertainment industry and continues to grace the global stage today. She coaches visionaries and influencers all over the world to neutralize poverty consciousness, tap into the quantum field of infinite possibility and master the art of timeline hopping. Hello and welcome as Raya Cohen. <laughs> as Raya. <Rhea. No! laughs> let, me, let me do it, it's okay. Hello and welcome. I'm going to do it. No way. Lou can cut this. So hello and welcome as Raya. As Ria. I can't even get As Ria. Oh my gosh. We're going to, I'm going to leave this in here. This is so funny. Maybe I just need to go with as Raya. I don't know. <laughs> no way. So just for our audience, I'm going to leave this in here. Just for our audience. Oh my gosh. Sometimes, you know how those words where you just, no matter how many times you hear them, you just don't wrap your brain around it. So I've had it in my head. As Raya and it's as Ria. And we've just been having this conversation like, let's re record, let's re record. And it's like, you know what? Uh, as Ria. As Ria. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it is so great to have you uh, on the Behind Closed Doors podcast. Thank you so much for joining me in this space. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I have to say, hearing you read my bio more than once was actually kind of fun. Like, I, I you know, like you hear someone read your bio and you're like, oh, that sounds legit. Like, I, <laughs> you know, that's, that's me. Is that me? Am I doing those things? Yeah, I guess I am. It's pretty cool. Yeah. I love the bios. I love how I've talked about this before in the podcast episode, how the bios are so formal and then the conversation is so informal. And, and when we read it out, it's really amazing to just see what we, what we have done and what we do. Yeah. Totally. And because so much of what I do is so intangible and I think so outside of the conventional norms of what people normally do with their, with their life, it's funny to hear it because it's like trying to find words to describe that which is actually indescribable. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like I, I use language as, as, as a tool, as something that I, it's, it's fun to me to, to play with language. And yeah, I mean, taking on a new name was a really interesting experiment with that, actually, because language is, is frequency, right? It's sound is frequency and everything is vibration. And so how does it change? How do you move through the world differently when you shift the frequency of the word that people associate with you? And there's been a, actually a pretty tr dramatic shift that has happened both internally for myself in terms of how I see myself and who I have chosen myself to be and how I choose to show up in the world and how that, the world reflects back to me that shift. So it's really interesting. Very interesting. So your birth name's Melinda? Yes. What made you want to change your name or what was the divine guidance for you to change your name? Um, well, it, it came through a... Um, a sister of mine who, when I say sister, I'm not blood related. I've, I've found, you know, I live in a, in a hippie community in California. So we're all like brother, sister. People are like, oh, that's not your actual brother. You're not your actual sister. I'm like, sorry, confusion. Um, I'm an only child. So whenever I say brother or sister, I mean soul family. But yes. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's fine. So, um, if you we're back, we're back. Yeah, we're good. We're good. Okay. So I'll, I'll get Lou to just cut that wherever she can cut that. That's fine. Okay, cool. Um, hold on. Let me just try and, because there's going to be a jump in your frame. That's okay. It's more the audio that I'm, that I'm concerned with. That's fine. Got it. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Great. Um, so oh, you were asking about the inspiration. Yes. So Divine inspiration for the new name came through a, um, an artist friend of mine who was staying in our home and she, she's very in tune, very connected. And she 
was like, I feel really awkward asking you this question because I don't want to offend you, but I keep getting this very strong message that your name is not your name. Like you, there's a different name for you. And it didn't offend me at all. In fact, it resonated because I've never really fully felt like Melinda was the right match for who I feel myself to be in the world. And I spent actually quite a few years really wanting to embrace the name Melinda and make it my own and really like, because it's such a soft name and there's such a, um, a melodic element to it. And in my life, I really didn't want to be soft. I wanted to be, I wanted to be this hard ass, tough chick, you know, like I wanted to not care as deeply as I cared. I wanted to turn off my empathic nature. And, um, of course I was unsuccessful ultimately. And I've, now I realize that's my superpower. But, um, so when I started healing that, that, that wounded feminine within myself that was saying, you know, being gentle is being weak or being soft is being weak. That whole story. When I started healing that, I was like, Oh, maybe now I'll embrace Melinda. Maybe it'll, maybe it'll really suit me now. And still it just quite, it wasn't quite the right fit. So anyway, her and I kind of sat down and we started calling in a new name and almost instantaneously Azria came through and it just made a lot of sense. Um, the components of how that name is built and the resonance that it carries. It just, I don't know. It, it wasn't something I had to think about a lot. It was just like, oh yeah, okay, this is this is the new name. And she was like my permission slip. I needed someone to be like, hey, it's okay. You can do this. You can be that weird person that changes that changes their name, you know. Um, and I had a lot of fear around it. I felt very. Um, I was very concerned that people would judge me. Uh, so it was, it was a big growth opportunity for me too to really claim that. In that judgment for you, uh, as as Ria. <laughs> It's so, it's so funny. My brain is just going, oh my gosh, I feel so rude to not even get that right. Isn't that crazy? I'm, I'm not at all. Azria. Azria. Beautiful. Azria. I, because I've seen it so many times written and I've got the connection with the Y, it's like to, to turn it into an I, it's like, come on brain, we've got this. I make it complicated for people because that's just how I operate. <laughs> no, it's perfect. So beautiful. Um, I don't even know what I was going to say then uh, for, for you with that uh, stepping into that change of name and being concerned about that judgment. Oh yeah, that's where I was going to go. So being concerned with judgment of what other people would think when you changed your name, were you already um, in a high profile space like you are now? Actually? Yes, it was, it was, I'd been, you know, I like high profile sounds great. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. I'm definitely sharing through my, um, through my platforms, you know, through social media, most specifically, and I was, I was starting to share my voice in, in the collective field, yes, and I had been for a, a while, mm -hmm. but, um, but it was actually just at the beginning of this year that I took on the new name, and I feel that since then, there's been a deeper level of empowerment that I've experienced, you know, and I'm sure there's a variety of reasons for that. It's not just the name itself, but it's the energy that birthed the name and that gave me the courage to claim it and own it. Um, and also realize, you know, so much of my journey has been about dissolving these personas or these identities that I carried often as masks to protect myself from the world because most of us, I think, can relate to moving through life and feeling like we should be something that's acceptable or successful or right. And so we, we, we're constantly kind of trying to fit into these boxes. And for me, the, the process of really breaking out of the box and, and demolishing a lot of these false identities that I'd taken on has, has led me ultimately to this place where it's like, okay, so in my purest of, of essence, what would be the, the sound that would capture who I'm here to be, at least in this moment? Because I might change my name again. You know, I reserve the right to keep reinventing myself as I evolve. Absolutely. A reason I asked you that was because there's so much pressure, I find so much pressure in a social media space to be a certain way. And I, I just wanted our listeners to understand that it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter how I say high profile, it doesn't matter how, how high profile you are or um, how many likes you have or how many followers you have or how big you are in the scheme of things. We still have the same concerns that what if somebody doesn't like me or what if someone passes judgment on me? I, I think it's something that we're constantly dealing with in ourselves, regardless of what level. And I, I just wanted our listeners to to get a piece of that and understand that we all go through the same things, regardless of what level we appear to be at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, especially if we're empathic and we're, we're sensitive and we're compassionate and we, 
feel deeply, you know, it's, it's, it's intense to be, to put yourself out there and to, to say, this is my truth and I'm willing to claim it. And some people might not like it and might get triggered by it and might just not resonate and might tell you that they don't like it. And, you know, I recently, I don't know if you followed my, my Facebook live that happened a few weeks ago when I was in Maui and, um, I, I shared about my, my, my prices publicly for the first time. And it un unleashed this whole avalanche of like, how dare you, wow. <laughs> you charlatan, <laughs> you know, it was really intense. Um, I mean, I, I checked my phone and I had like hundreds of comments and long threads, people writing like novels and then other people getting involved. And it was a whole thing. And I decided, okay, well, this is happening for a reason. There's a lot of fear that I see, especially in women, uh, around claiming your worth monetarily, specifically. And there's a lot of blockages around receiving financially in the way that is really in alignment with our, our truest expression. And I'm a big advocate of, of really shifting that. And so part of me shifting that meant getting over my own, whatever story I have of wanting to be liked and just stepping into, into the ring, essentially. And I did a Facebook Live where I, I called out some of the people who had an issue with, with me claiming my worth. And I, it wasn't about reprimanding them or making them look bad. It was really about understanding, trying to understand where they were coming from and giving people the opportunity to witness in real time how, I can tr how I'm transmuting that energy that feels aggressive or confrontational and transmuting it and alchemizing it into into something beautiful, into, into something that, like the coal that fuels the fire, you know, like we, sometimes we need a little bit of traction to like get us lit up and it's actually a beautiful thing. And so being someone who was very afraid of conflict most of my life and would avoid it at any cost, this was a very new experiment for me to like, be like, yeah, bring it. <laughs> it was great. Good on you. It's funny how everyone has such a, not everyone, I wouldn't say everyone, how a lot of people have such strong opinions that they voice when we post like that. I find it really interesting how many debates can go on through somebody's feed based off someone's opinion. And just, it, it just fascinates me so much. It is. I mean, social media is, is, I believe it's the first stage of a collective consciousness of, you know, telepathic communication. You and I are on opposite sides of the world and we're communicating in real time. Like we've found a way to transcend time and space. So we are, we are starting to connect with each other in ways that are so new. And it, sometimes it's intensely overwhelming to tune into the collective psyche and be like, whoa, there's a lot going on. That's like really noisy and kind of jarring <laughs> um, and scary at times, but also extraordinarily beautiful. Definitely. And I feel, and I'm sure you'll feel the same way. I've had conversations with other people about this as well. The more you make a stand for what you believe in, the more noise that's attracted. Yes. What does Adam say in his show? Adam, my partner has a one man show touring Australia right now. And he says, um, if, if, if everyone likes your shit, no, if, yeah, if your shit is good, so, and everyone likes it, it's probably not great. <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> because the moment you take a stand and you have a strong opinion and you claim it you're going to be polarizing you know it's and that's a beautiful thing and that's actually not something to shy away from i think yeah agreed absolutely so we have a few topics i, I just love how these conversations unfold naturally we we have a few topics that um you've put down for discussion so quantum evolution through plant medicine that sounds mm -hmm. super interesting i'm looking forward to to chatting with you about that we've got the technology of the heart and independence versus interdependence mm -hmm. where would you like to start oh you pick all right let's I just go talk all day about all of those <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'm looking forward to learning something new here. So let's go with, we'll just start from the first one. So quantum evolution through plant medicine. Okay. Well, um, so plant medicine is a very wide topic, you know, I mean, essential oils are plant medicine. Your kale salad is plant medicine to a certain degree, right? Yeah. Um, the, the plant medicines that I'm speaking about specifically are more of the psychoactive plants. So working, you know, with, with, ancient rituals and, and ceremonies that are have for many thousands of years been used by indigenous people to expand consciousness. 
Um, specifically, ayahuasca is a medicine that I speak about a lot that has had a tremendous impact in my journey, and psilocybin mushrooms as well, which most people associate them with a more recreational use, but when you use them intentionally and ceremonially, you can go extremely deep and you can you can access profound healing through those modalities. So the, the reason why it's quantum evolution is because we are able to transcend similar to, you know, the internet, we're able to transcend time and space when we go into these altered states of consciousness. So what that means is, I'm going to get pretty esoteric here really fast. So Great. <laughs> pop if anything gets too comp complicated or if I should explain any terminology, but, um, you know, we, we live in a, in a 3d reality, essentially, right? We have, we have our, we're, we realize maybe some of us realize that we're multidimensional beings, meaning we have mind, we have body, we have spirit. And those are kind of the basic dimensions that we experience within our daily life. Um, but there's actually many aspects to even ourselves that are, that exist beyond the sphere of reality. So this could be referred to as like the higher self or the soul, right? Which exists essentially on a higher plane. It exists in a higher dimension. And um, because it exists in a higher dimension, it's, it's non-physical and it has a bigger picture essentially of what's happening in our life. So if we're connected to our higher self, we're able to actually receive information that we from our limited perspective in this human experience wouldn't be able to access. So plant medicine specifically when used intentionally and with reverence gives us access to fragmented aspects of ourself that may have gotten trapped in the past, the perceived past, and um, maybe keeping us in a certain holding pattern, or even aspects of our future self that are, again, existing beyond linear time and space, and so may have information for us that we can then retrieve and bring back into this timeline. So this allows for quantum evolution because you are now no longer inhibited by linear time and space. You're able to go beyond the veil. The portal that is open through the plant medicine ceremony allows you to access more information, essentially more data, and then bringing it into this back into your body and bringing it back into your regular life. That's really actually the most crucial part because your spirit is non-physical, so it can evolve very quickly but your physical body is still moving through all of this density and it's, it's slower. It's like, imagine running through air versus running through water versus running through mud. You have varying degrees of density and they're gonna affect the speed at which you can move, right? So our spirit is, is non-physical, so it can move extremely fast. It can have a tremendous amount of growth in the non-physical realm, but then how do we integrate that back in, into the body and catch our whole external reality up to that new, that new point in time. Um, that's really the crux of, of what, I, what I'm interested in, is creating profound transformational upgrades and then closing the gap so that the reality around us can start to shift and rearrange itself and reflect back to us the new version of who we are. You're talking about what's happening from a spirit level and then integration for me is so fascinating. My body's just like, oh yeah, tell me more. <laughs> tell yeah. me more. Any questions you have, I'm happy to answer. I, I know that that space well, and I've, yeah, definitely, I would say ayahuasca has been probably my biggest teacher out of, you know, and I've had amazing mentors and coaches, but she's consistently, the, that spirit, that grandmother spirit is so profoundly wise and carries the wisdom of, of the ages. Um, it's like, it's like, like I, the way she kind of described it to, her, to me is like, if Gaia is president, then Aya is chief of staff. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Love it. She's, she's, she's the one who's like, okay, you do this, you do this, you clear out that. You, you know what I mean? She's, she's delegating, essentially, to make sure that we come back into a symbiotic relationship with the whole, which is why these substances and these medicines have really, like, they are blowing up. You know, there are Silicon Valley and on any given night in, Manh in Manhattan or any major city in the United States, there's hundreds, if not thousands of ceremonies taking place because entrepreneurs and business people are realizing the power that is there. Um, and with pa great power comes great responsibility. So for anyone who's interested, I, I just always want to say, be very, very just aware of the energy that surrounds 
this medicine <clears throat> and the people that you are, if you do decide that you sit, make sure you feel really strongly that this is the right person who's facilitating. And because with anything that gets very popular very quickly, many people jump on the bandwagon who aren't necessarily equipped to yeah. lead ceremony. Um, and I've heard the same thing as well, what you just said for the integration back. And sometimes the body can, uh, I don't want to take this on, but sometimes the body can struggle with the integration part because of what you've experienced. I mean, I think the biggest struggle that I experienced was if I, if I created an, an expectation to everything I experienced in ceremony, which was so profound, like, and, and you just know, you know, the truest part of you knows like everything is different. Not everyone has this experience. For me, it was, I came out of that ceremony, I was like different. I was just, there was an aspect of myself that came online that I didn't have access to before. And the pain that came from the integration was because there was an expectation that I didn't even realize I had that I would be able to just seamlessly translate that new aspect of myself into my daily life. But in fact, my daily life was still where I left it. And so I, there was this gap that had been created between who I knew I was and who I had been before the ceremony. And I had to slowly but surely, you know, recreate my reality. Like part of that was leaving my job. I, was, I got very clear in that ceremony that I couldn't stay in that job any longer. It had been my bread and butter job for six and a half years. It was, you know, it really a huge gift. And I felt terrified of walking away from that because I didn't know how else to, to support myself. So in ceremony, I was like, oh, this is going to be easy. I got called tomorrow. <laughs> cool. no, I'm just going to have coaching practice. and I'm going to be super successful. And like, I could just feel it. You know, I could feel the, the trueness of that. And yet translating that into my real life took months to actually be able to like walk away from that job. And then I met Preston and Alexi actually, right when, uh, when I quit that job, right? Like a, the following day. And they were, they were the, these gatekeepers to a whole new world. So, so much magic can happen when you trust. Yeah. I'm so excited. I just got goosebumps. My body just got covered then. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. So nice. And the mushrooms. Um, I remember as a teenager, I've only ever, it wasn't for ceremony. I tried mushrooms as a kid and I was a teenager and um, I said, I would never do that again for recreation. Um, yeah. It was quite a spin out of an experience for me. And in your experience from a, a medicinal purpose and for ceremonial purpose, um, how have you experienced that? So it's, it's, a, it's similar to ayahuasca in the sense that, again, it gives you access to these aspects of yourself that you might not be able to feel otherwise or see otherwise. Um, so it can be a tremendous uh, source of healing, especially the way that I work with them is different than how most people work with them. I haven't actually met a lot of people who incorporate it into the, into the coaching in the way that I do. Um, and so it's, it's a it really is a, it's an opportunity because here's the thing, right? Like there may be an aspect of myself that really must be healed and transmuted and, and brought back into wholeness and back into love that I've created such a separation from because I've, I've deemed it so ugly or so horrible or so unacceptable that I have now buried it somewhere in my subconscious and I can't actually heal it because I don't know where it is. I don't even know it exists. And so the medicine can, can take us to those places. It can open up, it lights up our brain. You know, we, we all of these neural pathways are opened and we can access the, these aspects of ourself. And that can be traumatic if we're not guided and held in that experience, because it can go both directions. It can go into the extreme positive or, you know, it could go into the very intensely, I don't even want to say positive or negative, but just it could go into the lighter, into the dark. And being guided and being held in that process is what I found is actually the most profoundly healing, especially with, with that medicine, um, which you would have to a certain degree in ayahuasca, depending on how hands-on your shaman is. You, most of the time, it's a pretty much of an internal experience where you go on your own journey and the, the ayah herself is guiding you through it. But um, there's so many different traditions and lineages. Sometimes the shamans will also provide hands-on healing and, and support you in certain areas. And so with the mushrooms, I like, I, it's, it's a very hands-on process for me. It's like getting very clear on what the intention is. Often at that point, I've already worked with someone for a while and, and then really creating a compass and navigating people through the experience um, in a way that is healing. You know, ultimately it's about just restoring wholeness.
and sometimes it takes people into really beautiful spaces and sometimes it takes them into scary spaces but at least they're not in it alone and they're with someone who knows what to do in those moments when things get a little hairy and that's actually what we want we want to go into those uncomfortable places because that's where the growth is yeah so for you with the ayahuasca you if you're working do you ever um take your clients to ayahuasca ceremonies i i mean i have i have group a group that i work with that i'll bring in for retreats um Perfect. so I, I don't serve the medicine myself but that's a, a longer initiation path that i have i'm just now really stepping into um which is very exciting to really learn learn the ways of the medicine the tradition um so i yeah i have you know i have resources all over the place um legal resources yeah <laughs> <laughs> i can i can direct people to and yeah because again like it's good to it's good to have a trusted a, a trusted middle person yeah and the um i just was wanting to understand because i have heard the same to always make sure you have a shaman or somebody who's very experienced in that space with ayahuasca with the mushrooms it's a different mm -hmm. story yeah yeah i mean like i said most people aren't using them in 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 a recreation or kind of way i mean i've in the conscious community here i'm seeing more and more people even if it's just a group of friends coming together and setting an intention and having, you know, a, a reverent relationship with the medicine, which can create really beautiful. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it can do so much depending on your intention. That's what's another big difference between I am mushrooms. I would say is the mushrooms are very programmable, meaning if my intention is to, to use them with, because, because I want to unlock more creativity or I want inspiration around a certain project, then they could take me, into that space whereas if i want to go in to heal trauma then they would take me into that space so it's a little bit more like what your intention is um you can you can steer it whereas aya has her her own like she knows she kind of knows best it's like grandma the grandma knows best you know you sort of you have your intention and then you trust that whatever you're meant to experience is for your highest good and sometimes it might seem like it's not at all what you thought you were supposed to have usually actually that's the case um, like I went, my first ceremony, I went in and my intention was answered in 30 seconds. She was like, yep. Okay. Next. And then she like took me on this whole journey and I was like, oh, this is what I came for. Um, so yeah, in intention is, it's that, it's that dance between intention and surrender, right. And not just in ceremony, but in life. And I'm, that's really the lens that I wear is like, how can I treat my life as a ceremony? How can I walk through life as if I'm in a living piece of art? and every moment is infinitely precious. And how does that change how I relate to the world and how the world relates to me? Feels so good. <laughs> what a beautiful viewpoint for life. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's go into the technology of the heart. Ah, yes. So in our culture, we've been essentially conditioned or you know trained to lead with our intellect, right? Like our, our intellectual capacity, our, our, our thinking, our analysis, those are tools that we are given and, and those are strengthened in, in all of our traditional school systems and everything is sort of designed to under, for us to understand it rationally and logically. And that is, the, the intellectual mind is useful to a certain point but there's actually, and it's a technology, you know, just like the heart is. Um, but there are actually other technologies that we have available to us that are far more equipped to navigate other areas of our life, especially like the emotional experience or the intuitive experience. And so for me, the, the stage of evolution that we're at collectively is about dropping from the head into the heart, meaning relinquishing the need to understand, the need for it to be logic, the logical, the need for it to even be linear. And to really start to tap into that innate intelligence that is in our heart that knows beyond reason, beyond logic, that just, that is so intuitive and so in touch and can read energy and can read body language and can be guided down pathways that the mind goes why are you walking that way and you're like i just i don't know i just need to go there and then you meet that person and everything changes right um 
So the technology, the heart, and there's actually scientific research, this is not just woo woo talk, but um, the heart is a highly, highly complex instrument. And there's actually more information moving from the heart to the brain than from the brain to the heart. So how can we, the only way actually to activate the technology of the heart is to begin to open the heart and to feel again, which is the hardest part for humanity because right now with the current state of things, feeling deeply is actually a painful experience. You know, if we really allow ourselves to feel um, and to empathize with the planet and, the, and humanity as a whole, immediately we'll be flooded with a tremendous amount of pain. There's been such a disconnect that's happened between us and, 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 our, and our mother, our earth. And so most people are, are so afraid of feeling so deeply because they, they don't want to go into the shadow realms. They want to feel the pain that they also limit their capacity to feel the joy because we're always feeling in all directions simultaneously. So if our capacity to feel is here, this is joy and this is pain, then we can stay in our little comfort zone here. We won't go too far into the pain, but we also won't go too far into the joy. If we want more joy and we do this, then automatically we also broaden our spectrum to feel in this direction as well. We're always expanding in all directions. And so we are in a game of polarity. So you're going to get more of the opposite too. And that doesn't mean you have to spend all this time in the opposite realm. It just means that you're going to be able to access it too. And sometimes part of the healing looks like carving out that like deeper polarity point and then it cracks you open to to this beauty and this bliss on the other side and it's it's actually all bliss joseph campbell has a beautiful quote that i always love to share which is bliss is a feeling fully felt i love that definition of bliss because most of us think of bliss as something you know like joy and light and love but he says no it's a feeling fully felt any feeling fully felt not not being resistant to it because we said it's not it's not okay or it's not appropriate or it's not comfortable instantly transmutes into bliss and that's that's been my my practice like how can i embrace everything that's showing up inside of me as as divine and allow the energy to actually complete its 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 experience through me instead of sh shutting it down and stuffing it there's such a rejection to the painful aspect, isn't it? The dark, as, as you have referred to it earlier in the conversation. I, I work with a lot of women as well, and I'm very passionate about shifting from headspace to heart space. And I find that it, even to cry or even to acknowledge sadness or even to acknowledge anger, there's so much resistance to that. And, and I find once that surrender kicks in, then like you were just talking about, we can go to the opposite side of both scales. I, I find that so fascinating. I do too, yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's, and I'm really interested in like, how do we give people the permission to feel? Like, how do we create these containers that are safe enough for people to actually open their heart? Because it's very difficult to, you know, demand or to ask someone to feel their pain if they don't feel safe in the world, or if they didn't feel safe with their parents, or if their parents told them, don't cry like a little girl, you know, it's, it, we create this rift or this disconnect between our um, ourselves and our emotion and then we're carrying around all this unprocessed energy in our bodies which then will manifest itself as disease and sickness and you know really our body is just crying to get our attention sickness manifests to be like hey something is off pay attention look over here you know and so it's actually again it's all serving even the sickness even the disease is serving us it's trying to get us to focus on that which will ultimately emancipate us and i love when we start listening that's that it's it's constantly there isn't it when you're transitioning i just think back i was 26 when i started my deep dive journey I, i've always had a curiosity in life and and always been open to shift and change and to grow within myself and i found from the age of 26 through to 36 was the time where um, what am I? I'm almost 38. So yeah, this year's just shifted totally. It's that full cracking open. Um, I found that I, I just found it such a struggle and a challenge to go through all that, um, as we put it, the, the painful side of things and healing the heart space and healing all of the past. And I know we're all on different journeys. So that's just my own experience. Other people don't need to go through what I went through. Um, but once I, I, I like, 
I believe everyone's journey takes the amount of time it's supposed to take. I'm sure you're exactly the same. Some people might take a year. Some people might take a couple of days. Some might take their whole lifetime. For me, that was a specific 10 years. And to come out the other side of that and to find that peace within and to find that unwavering center where it doesn't matter what's going on around me now, I have my center. So I can understand my emotions better. I don't go off onto this chaotic space where it's like, whoa, the extreme up or whoa, the extreme down because I have an understanding of how my, my being works and I have an understanding of my patterns and my program. So I think the 10 years of what I call for my own self, my sensitive being self, that struggle for me, it was so worth it to get to the place where I can actually look at myself in the eye. I can actually feel peace within. I do feel peace within. And that shift was like, boom, you know, it just happened earlier this year. I was in Bali. And, um, when I came home, it was like, I just, I don't know. I it was just so distinct. I can't give you a, an exact moment, but I came home and I was like, boom, I'm aligned. It's like, that's it. There's the lighthouse. And I would never ever change the experiences and the breaking open. And I'd say the cracking open as well, back to heart space, remembering who we are, I, I think is just such a beautiful thing. And for, for any of our listeners who are in that painful uh, self process of going from the way you've always been taught to be to seeking your own truth and remembering who you are, just keep going, just keep going. Cause there will be a day where you just wake up and it's like, boom, okay, I, I, feel, I feel different within and, and I have a love for self that I've never had before. That blows my mind. It's, it's so exquisite. I had this moment just came to mind in Maui. I went to Maui by myself for two weeks, which was the first time that I really immersed myself into nature and into like a really neutral environment um, without any like stimulation really other than my iPhone um, and, and had a chance to really like become present with who I've become and there was one moment where I was sitting outside and it was pouring rain and I was butt naked and I was sitting on the earth and I just started sobbing because I was so overwhelmed with the self-love that I felt. Like it was like these waves of just tr so much gratitude for all of the work that I've put in to loving myself in the way that I do today. It was just an exquisite moment of realization. Those moments are just breathtakingly beautiful, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could feel that. I could feel you. I'm quite empathic as well. And I could feel that in my body. I was sitting here just like, oh, yeah, really nice. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important too, that we, we take that time to acknowledge our growth because we're so conditioned to just continue to the next step, the next step. I got to get there. I got to get there. And it's like, whoa, up a second turn your head and just have a look how far you've come. Give yourself some gratitude and appreciation for the work you have done with self. Yeah. Being present, being with what's right in front of you, you know, there's, there's further to go and there's nowhere to get. Yeah. <laughs> there's, it's all right here. And yes, the journey will continue to evolve, but the more you can be with what's here now, the more stunning and exquisite and multidimensional the experience becomes. Yeah. Beautiful. Ah, oh, so delicious. And that's it, right? I, and you said something really important there. There is always uh, something else. There's always a, a bigger growth point. There's always going to be something that comes up that might shift you. I find it a really uncomfortable space. I know when I'm having my next level shift because it's really uncomfortable for me. Mm. And, and learning to just ease into that and allow that because I know my growth in that space is just about to shift gears. I think to have an awareness, that's okay. It's all right to feel uncomfortable. Yeah. It's like, can you be in the, in that, who, I think it may have even been Alexi. She gave me this incredible analogy and it was like, um, or maybe I give it to her. I can't <laughs> I may have given it to her. She gave it to me. I don't know. We're, we're one and the same at this point. No, she, I give it to her. That's right. I gave it to her. And it was, um, it's, you know, um, fruits that have like, um, like plums or apricots, they have like a hard center, right? They mm -hmm. have a hard, what is it called? Stone fruits, stone fruits. They have a, like a really hard pit. And so the, the analogy is essentially you're, you're, you know, if you're moving through, through your life and you're moving through your journey, like you're moving through the soft part of, towards the center, you're moving through the, the soft part of, of the fruit. And like, you know, there's some resistance and traction, but like you're moving, you're, it's, it's still, it's all flowing. And then right before you get to the center, you, you hit this hard ass 
pit, you know, and it seems like the stone wall and it's just like, I, there's no way. And you start to like try and beat it down. You start to like crack it open and it's just, there's so much resistance and there's so much pain, so much suffering. And that's usually the point where most people go, I can't do this. This is too hard. And they'll start moving backwards and they'll start going back into the soft, fleshy part where it's easier, right? Where there's less resistance. But it's not actually about using force to crack through the pit. It's actually just about being, can you be in the pressure cooker long enough and just hold out for the seed that's inside the pit to actually just bloom and blossom and come out and meet you? You don't have to break it. It's going to come to you if you can just hang in there and not give up. And I love that analogy. Sometimes having a visual just clicks things into place so beautifully. And I've actually been drawing a lot more. That's something I did as a kid. I used to draw all day, every day, and I completely stopped doing that. And recently I've had this inspiration to take some of these ideas and, and concepts that I'm being taught from you know the quantum field of possibility and really like bringing it into a vision, a vision into a, onto a piece of paper in a way that is like a diagram that just, it just integrates into my knowingness differently. So I recommend that to anyone who feels inspired to start to bring the journey, the inner journey tangibly in onto the page. Yeah, beautiful. Our minds are like that, aren't we? We do love analogies. We do love the visual to, to understand things. It's a, uh, yeah, brains are really incredible for what yeah. they love. All right, let's go into the last topic, independence versus interdependence. Ah, yes, this is a, new, a newer download, fresh off the press. <laughs> uh, I spoke at, a, at an event um, for the, the Female Intelligence Institute, and I had this, this, this big epiphany um, about it because a big subject of mine has been, as I mentioned, money, right? Did I mention this? No, I have read that. I have read that in your um, bio. Yeah. Neutralizing poverty consciousness is a fancy way of saying, let's make more money so that we can share our gifts more. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so really, yeah, it's about how do we allow energy in the form of money to come into our field so that we can use it as a resource and pour it back out into the collective in a way that's actually going to elevate humanity and not separate them further because most money currently is actually not, it's, it's separating us more than it's bringing us together. And so um, I was speaking to these women, it was probably 60 women, and I asked them how many of them had experienced blockages in their ability to receive monetarily. And I would say 98% of the room raised their hand, which was pretty astounding number. Um, and, and so this has been, a, a, I'm fascinated by money. I'm fascinated by the concept of money and how we hold it collectively as this extraordinarily powerful thing, which actually has no real value anymore because there's nothing backing it other than our collective belief system. And, um, and how we, and also, you know, the, the energy that's attached to money is, you know, everyone has their own money story, but there's collective stories around money that are often very, very damaging. Um, I mean, root is, money is the root of all evil is a common place belief system that is, creates a direct conflict between all the advertising that we see since the moment we're born, which tells us we need money to buy happiness. So it's like we're, we're in this internal state of conflict around money all the time. And I think it's just such a fascinating exploration because money is energy and um, we are energy. So what's the difference actually between me speaking these words and that energy flowing out and reaching your ears and you know us having a financial exchange what is actually the difference and so in my exploration of that um i realized that i had this very strong attachment to being independent it's like that felt like such a power position to be especially financially independent not not need anything outside of myself it's been a kind of a big theme right like how can we release all need? How can we step into just pure knowingness of our, of our innate abundance? And, um, and that has felt very empowering for me for a long time. And yet it was only allowing me to, it was, it wasn't, it was taking me only so far. There was like a piece that was missing. And so I realized that we think of, you know, most of the listeners probably have heard independent 
relationships versus interdependent relationships versus codependent relationships in terms of actual like romantic relationships and partnerships or even family. But I haven't ever heard anyone apply that to money. And this idea of being independent financially is actually ludicrous because I'm always going to be exchanging energy with other beings in my surroundings. Even the air I breathe and the earth I stand on is me engaging with, with, a, with a collective experience that I am inextricably a part of. Therefore, I'm never ind independent. I'm actually always interdependent. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces that humanity has forgotten, which is why we've fallen out of a symbiotic relationship with the earth and why we've created such tremendous damage uh, as a result of that has been this idea of the individual being, you know, king or, or being the focus. And we should, we should step into these journeys, especially in America. There's such a, like, um, there's such a collective consciousness around like the individual succeeding um, from rags to riches, all these stories of, of people who made it. And it's always the individual that's celebrated, right? But what about the tribe? What about the collective experience? What about the harmony of all things? And um, that was a big shift for me when I realized I'm never interdependent. Even if I have a business that I've created myself, I'm still having an interdependent relationship with my client who's paying me for my time. You know, that money wouldn't show up if I didn't have that client. So am I really independent? And so that was just very relieving to me um, to relax into that. And it's like, oh, okay, I actually don't need to be the only one who's like figuring this shit out. No, it's, it's about sharing the energy and circulating it and learning how to do that without blocking it, whether on the out floor or the in floor. Because most of us are pretty good at putting it out, but we're not that great at actually letting it in. That's why so many people have debt. That's an imbalance between energy out and energy in. And it's happening. I mean, the United States is like $20 trillion in debt currently. So wow. what, does that, what does that reflect back to us collectively about our imbalance between energy in and energy out? It's pretty significant. So yeah, that's, that was that topic. And <laughs> Done in a nutshell. Uh, uh, Packaged package neatly. <laughs> It's really interesting that my brain's just ticking over going, wow, what a really cool way to look at that, you know, just to shift things for you, doesn't it? When you look, I guess in every area we are connected always. That's really, yeah, really just shifted my brain. I sit with that for a little bit. I like that. Thank you for sharing that. You're in, welcome. Azria, mm -hmm. we're on it. <laughs> you got it. Uh, yeah, I got it. I've been sitting here while we've been talking, like, even though I've been present in our conversation, it just, your name just keeps popping in my head. I'm like, I'm going to nail this. Um, with um, the because so many people do have these uh, fears and imbalances around the money space, um, something I find is that we often define ourselves by the money that's in our bank. And if we don't have a certain amount, we feel like we're not valuable. And that's something I've been looking at a lot lately with my clients. Oh, excuse me. I figured out for myself, mine was different. Mine was around the way. This is so bizarre. This is a new learning that's just come to, come to me. Mine wasn't around the dollar account in in my uh, bank, it was, sorry, in my account, the dollar amount in my account, it was what I looked like. Because throughout my life, I felt like if I didn't, um, how do I get really clear on this? It was my value was placed on whether I was pleasing to my partner. Mm. And not that I ever dressed a certain way to a please or acted a certain way in that, but from the experiences that I've had and from the men that I've chosen in my life and from the way that they've been with other women, my worth was put around me feeling um, validated by receiving praise on the way that I looked. And I just realized that recently it was a massive shift in my, my brain space as well to understand that. But to flip back to what we're talking about in the money, I, I find a lot of people define themselves by their bank balance. So. In the processes, I've done a lot of work uh, listening to Esther and Jerry Hicks and reading their books and, and Abraham and understanding money and that it's a vibration and that if we balance our thought process and our belief system uh, with the vibration, then we can call in what we want. To simplify that, for any of our listeners that are in the space where they are not making the money that they want to make, they may be in a lot of debt, what would you say would be your number one or a few things for people to start looking at to shift that story around money, to shift their, where they're at with money? Mm. Well, I mean, 
you know, the, 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 the fastest way to get from point A to point B is to know what is point A and what is point B look like? What does that actually feel like? Let's define that. So, the, you know, an exercise I'll have people do very simple is just close your eyes, tune in without thinking about it too much. Just the first three words that come up when you are asked to describe your relationship to money. And, you know, it'll be all over the map. A lot of people will say freedom or pain or not enough, right? Like, let's say those are the three examples. So then it's about going, okay, so m many of us have attached money to freedom, right? To, to, it's like we've created this middleman, like money is the middleman to freedom. When in truth, the experience of being free is, is an internal it's a frequency you can tune into right now. You don't need a single dollar in your bank account to feel free. But if there's aspects of yourself that currently don't feel free, then that's where you want to look. What are the aspects of yourself that have created a story about not being free? Because at the end of the day, it's never, it's never about money. Money is just a manifestation of something deeper. So part of my journey has been as I've continued to declare to the universe that I wish to know myself as infinite as an infinite being that really is sovereign and, and doesn't define herself by other people's opinions of me or by my physical appearance or by the number in my bank account, but can feel my divinity just by being. The fastest way that the universe knew how to show me that was to deplete me financially entirely so that I didn't have the option anymore to lean on that. And suddenly it was like, oh, fuck, now all these parts of me that actually did believe that my worth was connected to that are now coming to the surface and getting really loud. And now I can work through them. So you always you want to understand that sometimes when you start tackling the money conversation, it can look like things are getting worse before they're getting better, because that's the fastest way for you to transmute those aspects of yourself that are still vibrating at a frequency that's blocking the flow that you're asking for. So in my business, I've gone through extreme abundance and extreme depletion several times. And it's because my intention has been to continually identify every last little fragment of myself that still is giving my power away. And sometimes that's not an easy path to walk. But in that, I found that with every round, like well, the first time it happened, I was like complete meltdown, right? Like life i couldn't focus on anything else it was like there was so much fear in my system there was so much insecurity that was coming up um and it was it, it took me a long time to move through that and then the second time it was like i was a little more relaxed and then the third time i was like okay i got this you know and then most recently like i realized wow i'm once again i'm, I'm i've been essentially depleted financially because of investments I made consciously that I chose to make, right? It's not like it just disappeared. Like I actually chose to put that money out and, and it doesn't change anything. I don't feel less than, I don't feel like the needle isn't being moved anymore by the amount in my bank account, which I think is actually a very healthy thing. Now, does that answer your question? I think, you know, that's, that's a good starting place. It's like, what's point A, what's point B? If you want to be picked up by a taxi cab, if you don't give them the exact address, you just give them a general region, it's going to be very hard for them to find you. So get really specific about your starting point and very honest, and then start to feel all of the emotion around that and start to process that through your system. And then get very clear, what is the, the end point? What would you like it to be? How would you ideally like to feel about money? And then depending on how far away that is, if you can't access that emotion at all, you know that there's still more work to do. And, and then it's just about tr really training yourself to, to, to find that frequency. Let's say I want to feel, um, you know, I want to feel light. I want to feel lightness around money. Well, I can feel lightness right now. I don't need money to make me feel light. So how can I start to cultivate the feeling of lightness right now? And then my frequency shifts and then I become more of a match to money. So that's the simplified you know, version of it. But money is very connected to power. Money and power are essentially the same thing because we, maybe we don't like to think of money as power because not, money is not power, but actually money is a representation of creative life force energy. And the more of that you have, the more powerful you are to be able to create in the world. And I also believe that money is not going to, I have this very strong feeling that money is not going to be around a lot longer. Like it feels like it's dying. The, the, the way that we currently hold it as a construct 
it's not sustainable at all. There's a tremendous inequality in wealth. You know, all the old paradigms are crumbling. And with cryptocurrency on the rise and all these new ways of exchanging energy, I really don't see it even being a part of our experience much longer. But if it doesn't matter actually whether it's money or cryptocurrency, it's, it's about taking responsibility for how we're engaging with energy, period. And if we have an unhealthy relationship with money, we're going to have an unhealthy relationship with cryptocurrency. So we might as well use it, you know, now to, to, to facilitate the healing and, and transmute that frequency. Yeah, great. I think just in that space as well, for, uh, for our listeners, if this is new, new information, I, I know that this is, when we talk about vibration, it's such a different uh, topic to what we're taught about creating money. I know from listening to, to Abraham, to Esther Hicks when she channels Abraham, it's like, get off the subject of money. You only ever have to put it out there once for what you want, get off it and feel into just to back up what you said there to feel into the vibration that you want to feel rather than the lack mentality of what you don't have. Step into that freedom of joy, step into what makes you happy in life. And the more, ha I guess the more happy you are, the more joy you feel. It doesn't mean you have to be beaming joy and happiness your whole entire life, but those frequencies then allow you to be more attractive to that vibration of money. Yeah, absolutely. I, the most recent download I got around this was the fastest way to get clients is to love them. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Like if you're in a frequency of love and you, and you're loving every being that's coming into your space, you, you become a magnet. Love is the most powerful resource in the universe. That is what, that's the, that's the, um, the revenue that you want to be, you know, nurturing and fostering. Like how much love do I have in my bank account? Like what are the reserves of love? And it starts with your own relationship with yourself. And then if you have more to give, then you're overflowing with love. And then the universe just comes to you and goes, how can I get involved with what you're doing? How can I write you a check? How can I work with you? Because you're already there. So it's simple, simple, not easy, but simple really. And, and, and I like taking the comp complicatedness out of it because nature is actually, it's a highly, it's highly complex, but it's also very simple simultaneously. The mind makes things complicated. So can we get out of the mind center and remember love is the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's why I laughed. It was like such a simple thing, isn't it? Yet we complicate it so much. That whole love piece. I'm writing a book at the moment um, nice. around, around self love. And um, it's just like, how many people reject the idea of, of self-love, just love in general, loving others uh, and, and self-love. But yeah, I loved, it was just so simple. Let's all just do that. Let's all just have self-love and love for everybody else. And then we'll all be able to receive what we want. Um, yeah. Because what we want is love. Yeah. <laughs> ultimately, isn't it? <laughs> we just give ourselves the love. We don't actually want anything. And that's when we're the most powerful is when we drop all the, all the want and all the need and all the trying to get somewhere else. And we're just so blissed out with where we are right now. That's the most powerful place to create from. That trust factor I, I found personally around money uh, for me to just surrender and mm -hmm. hand it to the universe and know that I, my, the universe always have, has my back. And I know throughout this year, it's my first year in business for self. And I know that you know, I've had my up and then like you were talking about before you receive and then it kind of depletes a bit. And, and I think in having your own business, that's in my personal experience, I've, ex I've had that. So we, you know, we go up and it's like, Oh crap. All right. <laughs> we're going down. And then it's like, okay, we're back up again. And then it's like, Oh shit, here we go again. You know? And, and I think to have that, what I have become very conscious of this year is that every single time I feel like I'm coming down in, in the, I guess the wealth space, the universe has always had my back right at that point in time where I think, yeah, always right. Right at that point where I think, oh gosh, do I have to go back and get a job? You know, it's that old, that old mindset mentality where you wouldn't do it, but you, you think it, it's like, no, I gotcha. You know, yeah. it's okay. Don't worry. Here you go. <laughs> it comes so unexpectedly. I think that yeah. it just in being able to surrender and, and trust, I think that's, that's that can be challenging but when we can do that and we know that we're supported like when have we not ever been okay totally and that's the thing we, we get in our own ways even because our, our ego will get spiritualized too so I, i've gone through this cycle where like i'm like okay i'm gonna create this stuff and, and then i you know i'm creating from a place of love and joy and i'm super magnetic and then money starts showing up and then i'm like okay 
now I'm going to, and then I start getting into my mind and I start getting into the strategy and I start focusing on the money and then like it stops working because I'm not in the love anymore. And now I'm in the, in the end goal or in the end result. And then it starts working and then I start going down and then I, all my panic starts to come up. I'm like, Oh my God, this is, I'm failing. And then I'll go through this whole process of, I used to go through this whole process of resistance and like fighting it and trying to fix it and trying to get back to that place of love and not being able to get there because I'm feeling a lot of fear and being like in this war with myself until I exhaust myself to the point where I'm so just over it that I just surrender. That's that golden moment, right? Where we just fine. And then the universe steps in and just like showers me with, you know, everything I've been asking for with the moment I stop asking for it shows up. And then my ego goes, okay, now we figured it out. All you have to do is surrender. So the next time then my ego is like, oh, I know this. I know this game. I'm just going to surrender, but I'm not really surrendering. I'm <laughs> trying to surrender as a tactic to get what I want, which doesn't work at all. So then I'm in this like trap of trying to artificially surrender because I'm trying to get somewhere else. And it's, it's so, it's so interesting to, to watch how the ego works and how clever it is, especially when it becomes spiritualized. And it starts using all of this stuff, like, to, to fuck with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And, but that was another thing where I kept wondering, like, why is it always last minute? You know, it feels like these Hail Mary moments where it's, everything seems to be falling apart. And you're like, I better go get that job at Dunkin' Donuts. And then suddenly, like, you know, Grace shows up and you manifest a client or whatever, get a check in the mail. And you're like, oh, my God, I can pay my rent. Why does it always happen in that last the nick of time right and i really asked spirit that the other day i was like why is it always last minute and the answer that came through was what if it's not last minute what if it's perfectly on time and that was just again one of those like yeah actually it's always been perfectly on time so this whole story of it being last minute is just my ego that wants the comfort because i want to know and i want to have it all figured out but is that really exciting or is it actually way more exciting to be so present with what's <laughs> happening right now that like you're always on your toes? My, what keeps coming to mind for me, a friend of mine, she says, oh, cheeky universe. You know, you're, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're so funny. I got you. I see what you're doing there. Oh, it has a sense of humor for sure. A wicked sense of humor at times. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great chat. I got tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. Oh. Azria, is there anything else that you would love to share before we wrap up today? <sighs> I would love to just share that for me in the beginning, a lot of what fueled me on this path was this, this story, and it's all story, right? We're all living various storylines, some of which serve us and some of which don't. But I was living this story that was very motivating, which felt, which went something like the earth is suffering and I have a, a, a mission to save the planet, you know, essentially like that's why I'm here. And it was felt so good to have a mission and to have um, something really of value to contribute. And recently I've, I've, it's become very clear to me that our beliefs are what shape our, our reality, right? Our, we, we can accept that we are all powerful creators. And so whatever beliefs we hold as true will be true. And if we as light workers all collectively believe that the earth is in a fucked up place and needs to be saved, then we're going to continue to manifest more of the same. We're going to continue to see a world in a fucked up place needing to be saved. So the only way to actually break out of that loop is to start to anchor in the belief that it's, our, it's already done it's already done. We're, we're already there. <laughs> There's, you know, we're already the hologram, the, 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 the beautiful golden age, um, the heaven on earth vision that so many of us are holding of us all living in harmony and this planet thriving. It's already available to us. It's up to us to feel it and know it and see it and hold it as true. And that's holding that frequency is what will allow everyone else to start to entrain into that frequency. And that has been, I think, just a big shift for me recently that I wanted to share because I think it's very easy to get caught in this trap of like, there's, there's something to fix. It's like, okay, the universe will give you whatever you say. If there's something to fix, here's more to fix. <laughs> Definitely. One of my favorite sayings that I use all the time, I say this, is that what you say is, yeah. 
profound. So start changing what you say. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us in this space. It's been such a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. It was really, really beautiful. And I'm excited to connect with your audience. Thank um, you. Yeah. Hopefully and where can they find you? Oh, um, so I'm most active on Facebook and Instagram. So Azria Cohen, I'll spell it. It's A-Z-R-Y-A-C-O-H-E-N on Facebook. And then I, Azria, like iPhone i asria on instagram and um then uh, my partner adam and i have a website called the slinky effect.com which you can visit and we actually have a very exciting new membership portal that's opening soon if anyone's interested in um, applying for that you can reach out it's going to be a small group we're going to go on a journey through the quantum field for three months starting in the new year so we'd love to invite your audience to participate in that Perfect. And I will put the links to each of your uh, spaces where the audience can find you. So if anyone's interested in that, they will be able to find that easily as well. Thank you again. Thank you to each and every single one of you who have tuned into this episode as well. I will catch you for the next episode of Behind Closed Doors. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please do so if you feel that it's a fit for you and you'd love more juicy content each and every single week. I'm always chatting with women and men across the globe who are making a difference, thought leaders, people that are walking their walk, talking their talk and making a real difference to the planet. Until next time.